Psi Access, May 11, 2024. Keynote presentation by Lachi. Awesome. So first and foremost, I want to thank Psy Access for having me here. I'm really excited to speak with you guys. And I'm really, I don't know, I'm really stoked uh, to be here today, this Saturday, to talk about STEM and why we need to be all up in it. Um, this is probably one of my nearest and dearest, dearest topics, not just the fact that folks with disabilities need to be in STEM, but folks with disabilities need to be everywhere. So let's get right on up into it because y'all have been here for a long time and y'all want to get out and do shit with your lives, but you also want to learn some stuff from me today. So I am going to speak and hopefully you guys are going to be able to walk away with something uh, that enriches you, whether you are a person with a disability, a person who supports a person with a disability or a person without a disability. So first and foremost, y'all already were introduced to me who i am and i want to thank you folks for that wonderful bio and i keep it long because i'm out here still trying to put my lipstick and my earrings on while it's happening so thank you so much for that why is a singer songwriter and actress and fashionista speaking to a crowd that works in science tech, engineering, math, and all of the smart people stuff. So I do have a lot of intersection with STEM. So in order to help establish some of my authority, I wanna talk about some of the stuff I've done in STEM so that you feel like, all right, okay, I get it just a little bit. Now I am gonna be relatively entertaining because I am an entertainer, but I do wanna really talk about why this is important to me and why I am part of this. So. One of the things, one of my biggest contributions, I would say, to the STEM ecosystem would be the fact that I wrote an NYU thesis assessing recording technology for low vision and blind um, professionals. And what I found in my research is that beyond what you would think that I would find, which is that it is more difficult for folks who are blind or low vision to navigate um, recording technology, is that at the other side of it, actually, when we discuss keyboard shortcuts, it's actually easier for blind and low vision professionals to be able to navigate simple basic tasks, easier for them than their non-blind counterparts. So it's not just easy to do simple tasks, it is easier for blind folks to do simple tasks due to navigating keyboard shortcuts as part of their everyday life. And so coming up with that solution allows us to go to recording technology and say, here's a universal design tip. Why don't you make keyboard shortcuts part of um, everyone's ease of navigation, not just blind folk? The second thing I wanted to talk about is my contributions to Google. Um, Google has two new tech devices. Uh, well, I don't want to say new. They've been in development for some time now for blind folk. So I myself being blind, a black woman with cornrows who is blind, which is my self description. Um, I worked with Google to help develop something called Lookout, which is utilizing AI technology to be able to place your phone in front of something and have it tell you what it looks like. You may have seen something similar in Be My AI which is the Be My Eyes brand that uses AI to be able to describe what blind folks are pointing that app device towards. Um, and then I also did, um, I didn't help contribute to this, but I helped with the rollout of their Google Guided Frame, which is a technology where if you place it towards your, um, it's when you're trying to take a picture, it helps a blind person know how to center the frame so that they're taking that picture. The last contribution I have made to STEM is my platform Ramped, Recording Artists and Music Professionals with Disabilities. And it's a tech platform that connects the music industry to resources, solutions, and people um, in order to make them more disability inclusive, as well as connecting recording artists and music professionals with disabilities to each other within that platform. I helped come up with the idea. I did not build the tech platform, uh, but I did work 
with folks with disabilities and mental health conditions to build out that tech platform. Because as someone who has found myself in a position to give back, um, I give back by just straight up hiring fucking people with disabilities. <laughs> I cuss like a sailor. I hope everyone is at least PG-13 age here. Um, okay. So before I jump right into my presentation, I did want to give you folks uh, a look at what Guided Frame um, looks like. And I hope the sound on this works. But this is a beautiful example of a relatively new technology where think tanks that were inclusive of people with disabilities, as well as folks on staff and who were um, uh, consultants who were blind, actually helped work create this product and then utilized myself to help roll out this product. This video is sponsored Perfect. by Google. Thank you. Photo. Three, two, one. <laughs> My name is Lachi, she, her, and I'm a black woman with cornrows. I'm a recording artist, cultural activist, and I identify as blind. Some people don't know this, but blind people love taking photos and sharing it with their friends, sharing it with their families. In frame, three faces, photo taken. And so to have something that will allow me to do it myself only gives me more liberation. Hold for photo. I love having the power in my Three, own hands two, to take the photos the way one. I want to take them. Photo taken. Switch to that camera. Here you go, your turn. I love my Pixel because of the superior pictures that it takes. And with Google's guided frame, I can capture all the photos I want and be confident that every shot is a good shot. In the disability community, Three, two, representation one. is everything. Photo taken. Switch to that camera. Accommodating people's access needs Three, should be an two, integrated one. part of our culture. That doesn't just mean trying to accommodate the bare minimum. It means including us two, in all one. parts. The fun parts too. Yes. Yeah. At the end of the day, these photos aren't just for me. They're for the people who love me. They're for the people who support me. They're for the people who are watching me and didn't think they'd be able to do what I do. These photos are for them. So there you have it, a beautiful piece of technology. And I, I gotta say, I almost like tear up every time I watch it just because of all of the work that went into it, all the inclusion that went into making the product and eventually rolling the product out. It's something that I want to see more of. And this is why I'm so passionate about discussing folks with disabilities in STEM. Oops. This video is so how do I go to the next slide? All right. So what is disability? Well, if you're here, you generally know what it is, right? Folks will say, oh, it's when you have um, a condition or an impairment, perhaps physically or mobility wise, or if you have a cognitive um, situation, or if you have uh, a speaking situation, something um, with your motor, right? Or perhaps you have a sensory condition. Sure, but what I actually believe disability is, is that it is a societal barrier. It is when you have something, a condition, that because of the way society is built, you have to navigate the world differently in order to access the same things as folks without that condition, right? So it's not the condition that is impairing. It is society that is impairing. So for example, say you are a wheelchair user and you are trying to get into a birthday party and there is a bunch of stairs to get in. Someone with a, so the, the party host could be at the top of the staircase and say to you, well, you know what? Go fix your legs and then you can come to the party. It sounds simple to me. That is what we call medical model. That is when you look at the disability as just a medical condition that needs to be fixed and that you gotta go fix it with no discussion of like, how much is healthcare? Like, is the hospital far away? Can I actually get there? Um, 
et cetera, et cetera. Like who's going to pay for it? <laughs> like what so social model is, is saying it is up to society to fix that barrier. Oops. So to have the, per Ooh, how do I go backwards? Um, well, it's to have the uh, person with the disability. Actually, hold on one second. Um, Arthur, do you want to help me hit back on this? I think just hit like the back arrow. Okay. <laughs> um, so basically what it is is saying that the social, that society should be able to fix that up, right? So the folks throwing the party could either have it on the first floor or they could have a ramp. Instead of you having to spend all sorts of, you know, energy trying to figure out how to solve for this problem yourself, society can work to make it so that you can get into that party without having to navigate the medical system. So a great example for me is, you could say to me, I can go to school and try to learn. And you say to me, well, you're blind, so go fix your eyes and then come back to school and then we'll teach you some shit, right? What the social model says is, at the end of the day, if I have Braille, if I have Zoom text, if I have a cane, then I can navigate the school and I can read just like my non-disabled counterparts, although differently. So I am no longer impaired, though I am still disabled. And so I think it's really important that we talk about what disability is and what disability isn't, and really understand that disability is a, um, and a discussion of societal issue and not just medical issue before we talk more about why we should be in STEM and why there aren't enough of us in STEM. And to recognize that it is not about the person with the disability's condition, but it is about society's conditioning. Now I'll say that one more time. It is not about the condition but about the conditioning that is the actual problem. So when you look at yourself as a person with a disability and you're like, oh, this sucks. Like, I wish I fucking had working eyes or I wish I had working legs or I wish my brain worked differently. I would challenge you to reframe that in the sense of, well, I wish that the tools were made available for me to use. I wish that society would be able to be more inclusive and accessible to all people so that it's not about me navigating the medical system to fix or cure something, but it is about us as a society to recognize the humanity of disability and make the world work better for everyone. I don't believe anyone should be embarrassed about their disability. I don't believe anyone should be ashamed of their disability. In fact, I believe folks should accept their disability or their neurodivergence or their chronic condition or their mental health condition. Because once you accept the deepest part of yourself society tells you to be ashamed of, you win. Nobody can tell you nothing. You are good. Like you can walk with your head held high to the side wherever however you want to hold your head because you are not ashamed of the body and mind you came in and fortune favors the freaking brave bold and authentic okay so before we get into the meat of our journey here i want to talk about disability culture right what is disability culture what isn't disability culture so when you think of culture, right, you think of what are the main things that people perceive of a certain group and what are the main things that that certain group contributes, right? That's pretty much what culture is, right? How people perceive a certain group and how that group contributes, right? There's two sides of it. So when we think of, you know, black culture, we, we think of, you know, the music, we think of the, the fashion, we think of the lingo, 
when we think of, you know, uh, when, when we think of Hispanic culture, we think of the food. When we think of LGBTQ culture, we think of the, the boldness, the colors, the brightness. So when we think of disability culture, I asked non-disabled folks and, and they remained anonymous, how they would define a disability culture. And a lot of them said, grievance. What? Grievance? Dude, dude, fucking black culture is dancing. Latina culture is food. Like gay culture is bright colors. And then like us is complaining. Like I don't want that to be my culture. That sucks. But I recognize that when we navigate a world that wasn't built for us, we have to boldly ask and demand for things or else no one's going to listen to us because of the erasure, right? And because of the whole, you know, guilt of, hey, you should be thankful for the little piece I gave. So I do understand that. But I believe that what we contribute really needs to be louder than the grievance. Because what we contribute is our, our music, our words, our perspectives, our thoughts that come through different minds and bodies that really haven't been celebrated, that are untapped. These stories are untapped. They're under celebrated. And so it is something that is genuinely and honestly new, despite the fact that we've been around as long as time has been. Our stories that discuss lived experiences that no one knows about is new. Our technologies that incorporate our different bodies and minds are not over the top the way they should be. However, we've been doing this stuff forever. We're the reason why all moms with strollers can go up curb cuts. That was made by folks with disabilities. We're the reason that text messages exist, right? We're the reason why text messaging is so like commonplace that people think that if you text message at this point, you're a dinosaur, like it's old news now. But deaf folks brought about text messaging. It's called the curb cut effect. It's called the fact that folks with disabilities are automatic creative thinkers, automatic problem solvers, automatic folks who have to navigate the world differently, that we are like fodder for coming up with new shit, being visionaries, like born explorers. And why is it that folks who are born visionaries, explorers, and creative thinkers are not literally like running STEM. Because if you think about it, I mean, science, literally the word science is talking about knowledge and figuring out new stuff. Technology is embracing newness, which is something that folks with disabilities do every day. Engineering, that's coming up with stuff. <laughs> Engineering is coming up with things and we have to build our own lives every day. Honestly, one of the reasons I was successful in music is because I was able to build my own accessible studio because I was having a lot of trouble navigating the studios they were sending me to. And I didn't like having to ask people where the bathrooms were. I didn't like that the recording engineer would have the little monitor up and he would say, well, do you want me to cut this wave or that wave? And I would go, sure. And then I'd leave the session with no music because he ended up cutting everything and I didn't know <laughs> because I was just faking my way through it. And I said to myself, I'm done. And I built my own accessible studio. And then I started cranking out stuff really, really fast because I had already lived a life of always having to like figure shit out and navigate things. And so when I finally had the things I needed, I was just like way ahead. And that is so true for so many folks with disabilities. Um, let's move on. Okay, why we need to be in STEM? 
and why there aren't enough of us. So I've kind of already gone over why we need more of us in STEM, but here, here's some of the issues, right? A lot of folks with disabilities don't see themselves in STEM, okay? Or, or don't recognize that the folks in STEM have disabilities because a lot of folks in positions of authority or power or happen to make it do what they can to hide their disability because they're so glad that they made it that far and they don't want any more barriers in their way or at least to appear as if no more barriers are in their way. So the young folks coming up are like, well, there's nobody in STEM, that's not for me right i had the same thing i didn't have any role models in music or entertainment or fashion right that looked like me that had my story that were navigating the way i was navigating and so i didn't actually start off pursuing music because i didn't have someone to put at the top of my vision board but the interesting thing about it is is twofold one there's a ton of folks with disabilities in stem okay they just aren't open about it. And so that's a stigma question, right? But let's talk about the fact that there are so many folks that aren't in STEM that should be. Okay, here's a great example. When I was doing my research for NYU for that paper about recording technology, um, one of the recording um, technologies that I uh, ended up really doing a deep dive into was a digital audio workstation, which is where engineers and producers, I guess, record and edit their music. There's a digital audio workstation. You may have heard of like Pro Tools or Ableton. There's a digital audio workstation company, tech company called NI, Native Instruments. And they're based out of the UK, but they're pretty big. And they have a controller which is a controller is a, hmm, now I'm getting like very music tech oriented, but a controller is like a piano that let's just say for instance, producers and DJs can use to perform, find beats, find sounds on the fly really quick, right? So Native Instruments made a controller that used auditory feedback, right? So when you press the button, it would let you know like boop. And when you press another button, it would let you know boop. And then also, it would hook up to any speech to tech technology speech to text technology that you had on your computer so that you had the option to have a voice tell you the name of the instrument or the name of the song right so if you're djing in a club you have your earphones in and you don't have to look over at your device to scroll through songs so after some time they found out they started using a um a way to collect data and they found out that five percent of their audience that was buying their consumer base buying this controller were people that were blind and low vision and i mean they didn't like market to blind and low vision people they just found out from data for people who reported it right so like it could have actually been higher than five percent and they found out that five percent of their user base for this controller was blind. And so then they decided to start leaning in. And then what ended up happening was a bunch of blind folks, they, they dug in and they found that a bunch of blind folks had all sorts of Reddit communities, all sorts of Discord communities. I mean, this was in the late 20 teens, so I'm not sure if Discord was around quite yet, but there were all sorts of community after community after community online of blind folks that were making plugins for this controller that were making straight up full on like tutorial guides for other blind users um and, and we i kept digging pro tools which is a really big famous you know daw that a lot of folks in here may even know about there is a a uh, plugin called flow tools where you can add this plug into Pro Tools and it makes it 10 times more accessible. This Flow Tools plugin was created by Professor Chi Kim over at Berkeley, a blind um, music technologist, and Flow Tools is everywhere. He's not hired by Pro Tools. None of the folks that were working in that in those Reddit spaces were working for native instruments. And 
you know, there are so many other digital audio technologies that have this same story of these ridiculously large groups of blind folks that are working on technologies for free just so they can use this stuff, taking away from their actual, maybe their day job or maybe their even their creativity to be able to build these communities to help each other to be able to use these things. And I mean, and I'm not talking about like, oh, you know, here's a tutorial on how to turn it on and turn it off. I mean, these folks are going in in and literally building technologies to be able to use the mainstream technology. And then they're giving it away for free. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, hello, Pro Tools, why don't you hire this guy? Hello, NI, why don't you hire these folks? It's one thing to have consult consultants. It's another thing to have folks on your actual team. Um, and the response was, because you know me, I'm Lachi, I just actually do actually go up there and ask. But the response has been, you know, well, this is a position for, you know, an audio engineer. This is a position for a tech designer, not just a blind person who just happens to be really good at it. You know, you have to have gone through the training, go through school, all of this kind of stuff, right? Because we don't just want you working just on the access thing. We want you working on everything. So I hear both sides. Like, I get it. But at the end of the day, folks with disabilities are so used to making our own stuff. We're just already doing it. So that's why there aren't enough of us in STEM. Because of the social, financial, and educational barriers. Right. I was just reading um, something from the NSF that was like, there is 27% uh, of American, uh, American adults have a disability and only 3% um, of folks who work in STEM have a disability. So that's really not representative of the actual percentage, right? That's, that's very small. And a few of the reasons that they suggest, and a couple of reasons that I added on, are these. One, there are the stigma barriers of a lot of folks with disabilities believing they can't even get into STEM in the first place because there aren't a lot of role models that are open about their disability in STEM. I believe it's because specifically in STEM, this is not necessarily true for, well, it is kind of true for other situations. But in STEM, it's, I've, I see it all the time, especially in the technology side of things, um, that folks with disabilities are like, I don't feel like being the poster child of disability. I don't want to be paraded around. I want to look strong. I want to look powerful. I want to look competitive. And so I don't want it to be another notch on my belt that folks go, oh, you know, I need somebody strong, um, physically fit and intelligent to be able to get up in the research facility or let's say get up in, in the, astro, the spaceship or whatever whatever you folks are doing here. And so you, you say to yourself, I don't wanna be that person that's passed over because I have a notch of weakness. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that that's all in your head. I mean, just a hundred percent, like I, I don't know how to explain it to people, but it really is all in your head. Um, the whole thing of people thinking you're weaker because you have a disability is because they are basing it on tropes and trophies from who knows, movies, media. But at the end of the day, you as an individual, if you also carry that internalized ableism, then you will project it, right? This is why I talk so much about what disability culture is and isn't. The fact that it is not your fault that you have a disability, um, but it is just part of who you are. And it is something to accept and frankly be proud of because I don't think anybody should not be proud of any part of themselves. Like, yeah, there's gonna be stuff about you you don't like sometimes. Like, sometimes I don't like my hair. Sometimes I don't like my date. <laughs> and then sometimes I don't like parts of myself that morning or that afternoon but it's part of who you are so be proud of your whole self 
But apart from stigmatic barriers, there are educational and financial barriers, right? It's not easy to go to school, <laughs> like especially as like, I don't know, Gen Z and, you know, younger side millennials, like it's not easy to have the money to go to school. It's not easy to have the forethought if your parents also didn't go to school or if you come from a broken home, right? Um, this is sort of a discussion of how we advocate to universities, schools, um, social programs to make sure that folks with disabilities recognize what they can and can't take advantage of to be able to get into school, what programs are available to them to be able to succeed at school, and how folks can get the money to pay for school, whether it be student federal loans, whether it be other situations, right? There is a lack of education on both sides of how to deal with getting more folks with disabilities into programs that have to do with science, technology, engineering, um, and mathematics. Um, and I think lastly is some folks are just discouraged. Folks with disabilities are often discouraged from entering something that may just be too hard, right? And so it's, hey, why don't you just dot, dot, dot. But the truth of the matter is, is whether you want to go to school for engineering or whether you want to found and become an entrepreneur for a piece of technology that you know is either the next big thing or not, you deserve to do it and you should go out and pursue it. Because at the end of the day, one of the issues with research having to do with disability is the fact that most researchers, I mean, let's just be frank, most researchers are cis, straight, um, white, non-disabled males, right? And so a lot of research and even test subjects will only really be beneficial to that group. And that's actually a pretty freaking narrow group of human, right? And so until we get folks with disabilities and folks with disabilities of different genders, races, and sexual preferences actually behind the desk, actually in the laboratory, actually working with the technology and actually putting together the proofs, the theories, and the scientific methods and writing those papers until we're the ones putting together the sample group to test we will have a hard time seeing a shift because we know what we need. We know what we want. We know the technologies that will help our lives be better. And the beauty of it is, is when you make the life of a disabled person better, you make the life of everyone better. It's like just part of it, it's built in because of universal design. So like, honestly, I personally think this is why most of my team are people with disabilities, because I personally think we need folks that are creative thinkers. We need folks that are problem solvers and we need folks that are driven and resilient to actually be the ones running the new dawn of technology, running the new dawn of science. Because when we're the ones bringing about the change, we're actually bringing about the change for everyone. So solutions, uh, like I mentioned, obviously some of the more granular solutions would be everything from universities to um, head researchers to laboratories, intentionally building out programs to bring in folks with disabilities whether it be to bring in folks with disabilities to eventually hire, whether it be to make sure that you have folks with disabilities as part of your testing samples, or whether it be to make sure that folks, you have programs and internships and externships and for folks with disabilities, so that you have research assistant programs for folks with disabilities. And that when you think of a person with a disability, you remember that disability spans across race, age, size, 
class, gender, um, indigenous, religion. Disability also spans beyond wheelchairs, blindness, deafness, folks with other mobility situations, folks with intellectual disabilities, folks with cognitive disabilities like dyslexia, folks who uh, are little people, folks who have mental health disabilities like depression and like OCD, folks who have chronic pain and chronic conditions, and folks who have energy issues. I think one of the things that we need to also recognize in terms of solutions is that once folks go through these STEM programs, these laboratories, these facilities need to be accessible, right? Need to be accommodating at the very least. And to let folks know that, yes, you do belong in this lab. You do belong in this program. But I think what I really want to focus on is folks with disabilities. I know, especially in STEM, it can get really, really lonely and hard and tough. And you think to yourself, you're the only one. You feel super duper isolated because you're the only one with a disability that through hook or crook made it into some room or in some classroom or into some program or, you know, everyone's kind of staring at you because you're a wheelchair user or a prosthetic user, or maybe you're using some other device to try to keep up. My solution for you, which is what I tell to everybody, is A, community. Find your people and you're going to find out that you're not alone. It's what I did when I was navigating the music industry. I went out and I found as many other music professionals, whether they were artists or musicians or whether they were on the other side, like admin or exec or, you know, agents and managers, anyone with any kind of disability anywhere that was trying to navigate music. Uh, we came together and, and I, I asked everybody, what was the problem? Like, what's your biggest issue? And everybody said isolation. But like, how are all 50 of us, 100 of us, 1,000 of us, all 27% of us isolated? It's a lot of fucking people. It's like 70 million people in America alone. And 15%, 16% of the global world have a disability. And that's just those who are reported. That's a lot of fucking people that are isolated that can just kind of get together and not be isolated anymore. So I say, number one, find community, whether it be through other organizations, whether it be through just going on the internet and following some creators and figuring out who their followers are, whether it be, um, you know, just checking out folks in Facebook groups, right? Find your community. But when you do, make sure you don't only share your woes, but your wins. Make sure you exchange knowledge. One thing I don't want us to do is perpetuate this idea that disability is grievance because disability is not just grievance. Grievance, everybody has grievance, you know? Folks of different races have grievance, folks of different genders have grievance, but then folks see them as having other things too. Why do folks only see people with disability as having grievance? So when you connect with folks, talk about your wins, encourage each other, add each other to your network. Don't feel like you should just be the only one. One of these issues that we have in the disability community is this crabs in a barrel. Let me just get out of this barrel. And then once I'm out, like I'm not, I'm not looking back. Well, the problem with that is, is when you were in the barrel, weren't you hoping somebody would bring you out, right? And so this whole idea of, I gotta be the only one, yet also I feel super isolated. I mean, that's some, you know, those are two sides of a coin that you shouldn't have to live. So build a beautiful, strong, bold network. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest and best solutions. I think the last one is find what you're good at. Obviously, you're here because you're good at something in STEM. So science, tech, engineering, math, or, you know, I don't know, city planning right? <laughs> Whatever you really like to do. Architecture, is that STEM? Is architecture STEM? I think it's engineering, right? City engineering. Or even if it's music and you're into audio engineering and music technology, or whether it's marine biology, anything like that. 
lean all the way in and get all the way good. Like get as good as you can. And I know that's probably going to require, um, you know, energy, right? It may require technologies that you don't have. Um, but if anything, it will require the internet, you know, just getting online and looking stuff up. I just, I want you to be really, really good at it because you don't want your skill to be in question, right? If you walk or roll into a place and you say, hey, this place has got to be more accessible or else I can't do my stuff. Then they're going to say, well, we're just going to get somebody better. And then you say, no, you won't because I am the best. <laughs> so make it accessible. So just get really good. Um, be very passionate about, about what you love, which is STEM, but also walk with your head held high uh, and uh, just be authentic, true, and proud of all parts of yourself. That includes your body and your mind. Uh, that's me, folks. Lachi. I know y'all thought I was probably going to like sing or something, but you know what? I just got off tour, so I'm trying to rest my throat. <laughs> so I really hope you folks enjoyed uh, my presentation, and I hope to hear from all of you. If there's anything that I lachi in in my the position that I'm in, which of course is you know I'm a recording artist and a public speaker. I do I do ads. I do TV. I understand that maybe. <laughs> Our paths don't necessarily mix, but if there's anything that I can do for you, here is my um, direct email. The whole team gets it. Please write to team at lachimusic.com. If you yourself happen to have anything to do with music, audio, um, whether you're an audio engineer or technologist, um, please hit us up. Uh, we would love to have you join Ramped, recording artists and music professionals um, with disabilities. And, um, or if you just want to fucking talk to somebody because you're pissed about disability and you want someone to make you freaking feel better, <laughs> that's one of the things I'm really great at. And if you are someone who is not disabled and you want your program or your situation to be more inclusive, um, feel free to hit me up. But honestly, just do the research and be inclusive. All right. Thanks, guys. Lachi, thank you so much. That was fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left. So if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and submit them to our Q&A now. Uh, we have a few pouring in for you here. Awesome. Um, the first is from Caroline, who asks, what screen reader accessible software for audio and video editing do you recommend or use? Ooh, for audio and video editing. Um, so it kind of depends. So I personally use a combination for someone who is legally blind. I use a combination of Zoom text and screen reading. Um, so I'll use narrator. Um, and I've also used um, just straight up voiceover. Now, if you're an Apple or a Mac user, um, they're doing what they can to make voiceover as compatible as possible with something like Logic. Um, however, if you if you use if you're uh, trying to specifically do audio technology, audio editing, there is a digital audio workstation called Reaper which I've learned as a person who is blind, is probably the most accessible digital audio workstation for folks who are blind. Um, and they actually go the extra step of priding themselves on being um, accessible to as many screen readers as possible. They consistently do sort of small mini research situations on how to keep all of their new updates accessible um, with as many different screen readers as possible. Um, another uh, digital audio workstation that's relatively uh, good is also Pro Tools. Um, and then again, um, Native Instruments is doing what it can to be accessible. Um, so I don't know if that helps answer your question, but for the, for the larger schema of things, a lot of folks are using VoiceOver with Logic because it's so integrated. 
fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, for our next question, can you tell us a little bit more about times when your disability was an advantage in your industry? Yeah. Oh, are you kidding me? So um, <laughs> my disability, my disability has been um, an advantage in, in my industry. So the first thing that I had told you guys was when I got fed up uh, going to recording studios, that was around 2018. Um, so I started building out my own recording studio because I wanted it to be more accessible to me. Um, so I have this like ridiculously large monitor. I configured short keyboard shortcuts. So I don't even look down at all to try to finger pick. Um, I have it set up. I know exactly where the restroom is, et cetera, et cetera. So when COVID hit in 2020 and all of my counterparts, me being a uh, vocalist as well as uh, a record producer, I didn't have to go anywhere. Meanwhile, a lot of my colleagues and competitors uh, did not have anywhere to go and were losing out on work. So a lot of DJs as well and producers and um, a lot of other folks were looking for vocalists because now they weren't touring either. And so they were looking for vocalists to hurry up and, and lay down some tracks on all of these new amazing you know home beats they were making. And of course, I was there ready to take on that huge influx of work that wasn't even available before the pandemic. Um, that blew me right up. Uh, I was able to really start paying rent and then paying for another studio here in Manhattan, which is one of the most expensive cities in the world because of the fact that I was ahead of the curve because of the thought of making my own studio accessible. Um, another really interesting thing is I use a cane. Um, I used to hate using a cane. When I was a kid, they told me to use a cane and I was like, I'm not gonna use a cane. I already have so many people looking at me and making fun of me and this and that, and it's gonna be embarrassing and this and that. So I navigated a lot of the music industry sighted passing, I guess is what I'll call it, as my vision declined and declined. And I really needed a cane, right? Um, as I got into bigger and better rooms, I'm here at, you know, the, the Sony recording studio, or, you know, we're working with major rappers and major artists. And I'm going in there and I'm like, I need to give my best, right? These are the people I've always wanted to work with, but I'm not. I was walking in there tripping over wires, where I was being invited to these galas in these dark nightclubs and missing a handshake or hand wave that cost me a fucking whole record deal, you know? So um, I started using my cane. And at first it was for me to navigate and to also alert people to the fact that I had a disability. At first I was afraid people were gonna think I was not competitive, but eventually, you know, people were just like, oh, hey, Lachi, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> Um, and folks weren't actually as weirded out because I had already kind of established myself, um, with a disability. Here's one of my canes. So now I glam up my canes as I navigate the, the music industry. And what it does, especially having these glammed out canes is it says, hello, I'm loud. I'm proud. Um, I'm bold. I'm authentic. I'm not afraid of anything. And I walk into the club and everybody knows who I am. Um, they walk up to me. Now I don't have to worry about handshakes. And they say, hey, how are you? Uh, I can navigate the studio without tripping over wires because I have my cane. I know where the vocal booth is. I know that people will say, hey, um, knowing that you have, that you're legally blind, they will now ask me questions about whether or not I can see something or not, instead of just assuming I'm kind of goofing off or not paying attention or perhaps have a learning disability, right? So that's been super duper helpful. And lastly, but most honestly and importantly, um, is I stand out. I have a story. You know, for so long, everybody was just like, oh, you're trying to be Alicia Keys. And I th maybe it's the braids. <laughs> oh, you're a, you're a black blind. I mean, no, not blind. You're a, you're a black female musician that plays the piano. Like, who, who are you trying to follow? Um, and I was able to say, you know what? I'm building my own path. This is my story. 
here is that multi-dimension that I add and that I bring, right? So now I'm walking in and be, and I have now become sort of the go-to voice um, on accessible spaces um, and beyond disability on discussions of intersectionality, on discussions of mental health and wellness, um, on, on discussions of safe um, spaces for, for, for sensory folk. Um, so it goes beyond just this discussion of disability. And I don't know, you know, I stand out. I stand way out. And because of that, I'm super duper bold, proud, and authentic. And that drives people to me. Like that, that um, you know how they say fortune favors the bold? Honestly, I think fortune favors the authentic um, today because I'm not afraid to be vulnerable. I'm not afraid to talk about my disability. And folks are like, wow, you're so courageous and you're so like brave to talk about that stuff. And I'm like, I'm not brave or courageous. I'm just a girl who's blind that's tired of having to explain myself. So I'm using a cane. <laughs> um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it it's definitely had a lot of its benefits. And these canes matching with my outfits. I mean, these are fucking cute, guys. Okay. <laughs> I loved that answer. And it actually leads into a question here. Someone wants to know, how do you make the sparkle canes? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I personally, myself, self don't make them, um, but my team uh, makes them. And we actually run a, a website called Glam Canes, G-L-A-M-C-A-N-E-S, glamcanes.com. Um, and it's so funny because they're taking off. So these, let me, let me get this, where is it? Here it is. So if you look at it, it's actually rhinestones. Can I get it? I don't know if this is. Yeah. Know. So they're um, individual little rhinestones. They're really pretty. Um, and so we have them in different colors and stuff like that. And it was so funny because we were like, hey, let's start selling them. And we talked to a few folks and they were like, nobody's going to want to buy. You know, blind folks don't have money. Like you're wasting your time. And so I said, no, I'm going to try it out. Uh, and we made the glamcanes.com website and they're selling like hotcakes or hot canes or whatever you want to call them. <laughs> and it's so beautiful to see like, you know, not just girls on a first date or like Swifties and Bayhivers, you know, running around at concerts with the cane. Um, but also dudes are walking around with like sleek little tuxedos and a cane at a gala or at a big event or at a graduation or you know we made um for pride last year a bunch of folks wanted canes that were different colors like the swirl of the rainbow uh which we made and i'm telling you right now folks are buying them folks are buying them for their friends moms are buying them for their daughters teachers are buying them for their students like it the beauty of the cane is that not only does it you know, make the, the blind person or, or the cane user feel confident, right? And want to be seen, right? So it's like, you know, the cane that used to be embarrassing now makes you want to be seen with it. It combats erasure. It's its own sort of built-in advocacy. So A, you don't have to explain anything to anyone. You look dope. And it's not one of those, oh, that's so pretty. You put little butterflies on your cane, like, yay for you. No, this is like a dope ass, like adult fashion type of cane. Um, it's got the built-in advocacy. It's got the built-in um, anti-erasure to it. Um, that makes me really super duper proud. So yeah, glamcanes.com. Check it out if you're interested. And we just put that in the chat for folks as well. So <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, we have another question here um, about the music and entertainment industry asking what changes do you want to see made to make it more inclusive and to foster genuine representation and opportunities for disabled people in the industry? Yeah, you know, so first and foremost, and almost to go back to that other question about how my disability helped in the music industry. So to kind of tackle those in the first half of my responses, you know, A, ramped recording artists and music professionals with disabilities, which is um, the, the sort of platform slash organization um, that I founded two years ago now, uh, which really apart from equipping the music industry with disability inclusive solutions is also a network 
of and a network and community of music professionals and audio tech folks um, with disabilities and neurodivergence, right? And so this whole idea of isolation and this whole idea of not having the voice to be able to sort of stand up to different industry firms, live entertainment firms, you know, to discuss maybe ticketing or to discuss um, other sort of creator rights that should include folk creators with disabilities. Um, we are that entity or we're creating that community so that we can be that voice. Um, so that is what Ramped is. However, what we really need to see and what Ramped is, is fighting for and hoping to build is inclusion everywhere, right? Like it's one thing to see a person with a disability on the stage. It's, a, it's one thing to see maybe a person with a disability win an award at an award ceremony like the Grammys or the Tonys or whatnot, right? But we need to go beyond the green room and see disability it, in the boardroom, in the mail room, at the desk and writing the checks. Because when we are able to really start infiltrating this system and have folks sort of at the top um, with disabilities, that is when we will start to see change. It's really the behind the scenes change that is the change. It's really when we have champions in the background that have decision making authority that we start to see change. So the, one of the first things I did when I started getting like even just like a small modicum of power in the recording industry um, was to start joining as many boards as possible. So now I'm on, I think I'm on at least six, you know, pretty high level boards in the industry because not only do I want to make sure that there's a voice with disability kind of talking about inclusion and access at that level, but also so that I could turn around and get all of my friends in. <laughs> right. And so that from the sort of top level to the mid level to the bottom level, we start seeing people with disabilities making the decisions. So a great example is this in the music industry. There's an organization that's about as old as Ramp. So it's a little older, maybe three years. They're called Queer Capita and they are what Ramp is, but for the LGBTQ community. So they're like a professional affinity group for um, folks who it are in the music industry that are LGBTQIA+, right? What they're doing and why they're really infiltrating uh, the music industry much faster than Ramped is, is because they're tapping in all of the folks who are, you know, director level and VP level and saying, you know, hey, people up there, are any of y'all gay, right? And they're going like, I am. And then they're saying, hey, can you partner with Queer Capita to put together a, a internship program? Can you partner with Queer Capita to put together an artist showcase? And these are like people that are director level at like YouTube and Amazon and Vivo and CBS and N MSNBC. And so they're able to work with folks that are way up there who are LGBTQIA because the stigma of being LGBTQIA is not so high anymore that folks who are gay that made it up there, maybe they were closeted until they got up there, but now they're like, all right, let me help folks behind me. And so what we want to do as people with disabilities in the music industry is start to get folks with disabilities and neurodivergence um, either A, up in those top positions and infiltrating all of the positions, and or B, get the folks already in those positions who do interface with disability, neurodivergence, chronic conditions and mental health, et cetera, to turn around and help their, their fellow community. I 100% believe that the way we do it is infiltrating the system. And I recognize the, contradic the contradictory space you kind of have to live in, right? It's this contradiction of, boo, your system sucks, like tear it down. And then also like, can I be a part of the system? <laughs> um, but you really can't break down a system you're not a part of, right? So it's about getting us into that system so that we can start to change it. Sci Access. Learn more at www.sciaccess.org.